The Italian Renaissance is famous for reviving classical learning, but in fact what's happening here 400 years earlier seems to be just as vital. Do you think that Muslim scholars aren't given due credit for what they're doing in Islamic Spain at this time? It is not something that you would learn about in school probably, or even at university. It was probably conscious process of neglect and uh, now uh, we are still suffering from that. Extremely selective history writing. That's right. <laughs> It is due to the conflict that existed between the two worlds. These remarkable ideas were leeching out of Al-Andalus at precisely the same time that the Christians were flooding in. The frontier, which had started far north of Madrid, was gradually pushing southwards. Then, in 1236, Cordoba fell, followed by Valencia and Seville, until by 1250, only the Kingdom of Granada remained Muslim. From now on, Spain would concentrate on cleaning the Muslim presence from its country. The Islamic influence on Europe has been quietly laid down, but when it came to the physical expulsion of the Muslims from Spain, that would be an act that was anything but subtle. It was shocking and absolute. The history of Al-Andalus was about to take a new and sinister turn. In the city of Granada, the Muslims were to fall victim to one of the most shocking acts of ethnic cleansing that Europe has ever seen. Long after the rest of Al-Andalus had fallen to the Christians, Granada remained defiantly Islamic. Protected by mountains and those giant watchtowers and forts, the 70,000 Muslims who lived here managed to hold off attack for another 200 years. But time was running out. While Granada occupied a small territory in the south of Spain, the rest of the country was now divided between Castile in the west and Aragon in the east, two very powerful kingdoms. The King of Castile was about to be forced to pass his kingdom to his niece, Isabella. Isabella was headstrong and passionate, but she also had an acute political mind. In 1469, at the age of 18, she married her second cousin, Ferdinand, the dashing heir to the throne of Aragon. Now, the two most powerful Catholic dynasties in Spain were united, and the reconquest was edging ever closer to completion. Granada was blocking Isabella's vision of a unified Spain, and so it had to be reclaimed. The city was laid to siege for a year before it finally surrendered. On the 1st of January, 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella dressed in elaborate Moorish outfits, which they had especially made. With great pomp and circumstance, they entered the Palace of Alhambra and took the keys to the city. As the Muslim ruler, Boabdil, left in tears, it was said that his mother spat out at him, do not weep like a woman, for that which you cannot defend like a man. Isabella's victory in Granada put an end to an incredible society. In the 700 years that they'd been in Europe, the Muslims of Al-Andalus had built a culture which was the very pinnacle of civilized life, influencing Europe in ways that we're only just beginning to understand. And Isabella would endeavor to ensure that Islam in the West would never enjoy such a relationship again. A few years after Ferdinand and Isabella came to power, they set up an organization that affected the most extreme form of religious control that Europe has ever known. The Inquisition. The purpose of the Inquisition was to track down and eliminate anyone who wasn't an orthodox member of the Catholic Church. Those found guilty of heresy were subjected to a sinister public ceremony called an auto de fe. 
In this eerie ritual, vestiges of which are still performed today, the guilty were forced to repent their sins while their accusers watched on, hidden under hooded caps. The sinners were then detained. Some were burnt at the stake. Most had their homes and livelihoods taken from them. In 1526, the Spanish Inquisition came to Granada to deal with the Muslim problem. Muslims were labelled heretics and given a stark choice. Convert to Catholicism, leave the country, or be punished. The Muslims of Granada were segregated from the rest of the population. Their ghetto survives as the old quarter of the city today. It's a fantastic house. We're, we're, uh, thank you. Many of the houses that the Muslims were forced out of are still standing. Antonio Orjuela lives in one. It's almost inverted because you don't have any windows looking out onto the street, but the, but the focus is, is in the middle here on the courtyard. Yes, the courtyard is the centre of the family life. So all the doors and windows are open to the courtyard and close to the, to the street. Privacy was one of the most important characteristics of these houses. Outside the house, they were Christian. They went to the church with the priest. They celebrate the wedding in the Christian way. But then, later, they came home to celebrate again the wedding in the Muslim style. And um, what happened, though, when the, when the Inquisition came knocking on the door? Well, as you see, uh, these houses had the bent entry. So from outside, even if the door is open, it's not possible to see what happens in the courtyard. The Inquisitors went from door to door, seeking out those they still suspected of being Muslim. A number of civic leaders had already been expelled, and so often it was only women and children left. They herded them up and held them in churches by night so that they could be tried the following morning. Some of the women cried out that they were like lambs being taken to the slaughter and wished that instead they'd been allowed to die in their own home. The Inquisition was so brutally efficient that within 20 years, all Muslims in Spain had been forcibly converted to Catholicism. But this wasn't enough. Many still continued to practice their faith in private. And so, in 1609, the Spanish crown ordered the removal of all Muslims from Spain. Perhaps the most shocking thing in the expulsion is they were not actually expelling Arabs, nor were they expelling Berbers. The huge majority of the people that were being expelled by blood, by DNA, if you will, were as Iberian as their Christian cousins in the north who were kicking them out of the peninsula. It's really quite, it's an enormously different vision of what the expulsions were and what they meant when we realize that the people who were being thrust out were as native to the peninsula as the Christian kings. Why do you think the Catholic authorities felt they had to expel the Moors in 1609? The Spanish Empire, for it was indeed by then the Empire, simply felt pressed by in so many different directions. Uh, they were very much afraid of the Turks, who were in fact raiding from North Africa and raiding along the southern coast of Spain. They were fighting wars still in the Americas. It was one internal problem that they simply could not deal with any longer. In 10 years, over a quarter of a million Muslims were expelled from Spain. Forbidden to take any possessions with them, most sought refuge in North Africa. When Isabella and Ferdinand died, this is where they were buried. It's a little corner of the Alhambra and it's decorated with inscriptions from the Quran. They read, there is no true God but Allah. In many ways, it's a curious choice for a Christian entombment, but it does speak of that complicated relationship that was enjoyed by the Catholics and the Muslims. 
On one level, it says that Isabella and Ferdinand were still half in love with all things Islamic. But on the other, it's a bold and uncompromising statement of control. And in Cordoba, the new Catholic rulers did something unbelievable. In a daring act of what can only be described as inspired vandalism, architects gouged out the center of the mosque. In its place, built one of the most spectacular cathedrals in Spain. The result is a shocking and blasphemous conflation of two of the world's most powerful religions. It is unnervingly beautiful, but possesses an underlying schizophrenia, as if a terrible and silent battle is being carried out in the very architecture of the building. Spain's troubled relationship with its Muslim past continued into the 20th century. The dictator Franco invented his own version of his country's heritage. For Franco, this period was somehow interrupting what was for him a continuum history. He wanted somehow to, if not delete it, he wanted to forget about it. So what he did was to explain the whole Muslim or the whole Al-Andalus as a kind of continuum from the Visigothic period to the uh, Catholic kings by saying that the Muslims in Al-Andalus were not such big good Muslims but much more Christianized. So this is the political use of history. He wanted to explain the identity of being a Spaniards. And for he Franco that identity was a continuation from the Visigothic period right through to the Catholic period. Yeah, exactly. Serafin van Hul is an academic whose books on the history of Al-Andalus are bestsellers in Spain. Do you think that Spanish people today are proud at all of the Arabic episode in their history, or, or are they ashamed of it? No, 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 no not at all. Strictly speaking, it's not our past. It's the past of other people. As a modern-day Spaniard, I would feel very little connection with the Arab past. Spanish people don't live like them. We don't dress like them. We don't feel like them. I don't know how you can say we are the same, because we are not the same. We have nothing in common. Nothing in common. And if I weren't a professor of Arabic studies, I would have absolutely no feeling for Muslim culture. For a very long time, people have protested and urged that history be truthfully told, that they not be fed this nonsense. But this is the inheritance of the Inquisition. The Inquisition's character is alive and well. I can tell you one thing. Spanish people have a tendency to prevent others from speaking their minds, a tendency to try and control the way others behave and think. You can be sure that when you try and speak the truth, you pay for it. And so Al-Andalus fell. East became East and West became West. Two distinct cultures, politically and religiously divided. And yet what the history of the Moors shows is that these two cultures are also linked in ways that we might never have imagined. The West has been inspired by Islam, but more than that, it was in the very act of fighting the Muslims that Europe consolidated its identity. When we started, Christopher Columbus was setting sail for the New World. And as he pointed his boats westwards, Spain aligned herself with him, turning away from the East. The Muslims had been fought, and now they were to be forgotten. 
As time went by, memories of the Islamic past were moulded until they became a more comforting storybook version of history. But this is a case where truth really is stranger than fiction. The story of Al-Andalus isn't a simple tale of good versus bad, east versus west. It's intriguing and complicated, it's brilliant and brutal. It's very human and it's very messy. And it's for precisely that reason that it needs to be remembered, not written out of the history books.